I'm Rose Magpie, but you can call me anytime. No. <laughs>
when I tell you that I still regret doing that every day since making this, I mean it. If you're making just a foam or cardboard dagger, please do it all in one piece. The reason that I cut the pattern off here instead of doing the entire thing in one lump sum was this, making a silicone mold for the resin dagger version. I thought by doing it this way and having the nub of the handle instead of going all the way down, I would save myself money on silicon and resin, which to be fair, I did. But if you want it more stable, then yeah, do, do, the, do the entire thing. Don't, don't pull at me. <laughs> I just made life so much more complicated for myself. But speaking of resin, we're gonna move on to the resin dagger. I needed to build up a house for the silicon to sit in. I've seen many tutorials and you can use many things, but I decided what worked best for me and was cheapest was cardboard. So I covered the cardboard in tape so it would be easier to peel off. With the bottom sheet of cardboard covered in tape, I then lightly glued down the foam dagger as flat as I could on one of the flat sides. I then covered strips of cardboard and tape and built up a little house around the outside of the dagger, making sure I filled in all the cracks with hot glue. Did I miss some? I definitely missed some. It, it did leak a little bit. That's nothing. Some more hot glue can't fix. Hot glue really be a lifeline in the cosplay community. <laughs> Lifesaver. Once that was done, I began mixing up the silicon. Like resin, it comes in two parts. This is only like my third time doing this, so I never know if I did it right. I do know, however, that I wish I had a bigger cup because I had to stir so carefully because I nearly overfilled the cup. Just, just do it in two batches, all right? I know this is a tutorial, but most of the time when I'm crafting, I make it up as I go along. It's, it's, it's a learn with me, you know, it's a learn with me. Bit, bit of give and take. Make sure that it is mixed thoroughly because mine was definitely not mixed thoroughly and you could see that by how it was settling and it looked really cool like a swimming pool. But because of that, it is very, very, um, it, it didn't set well. I also wish I'd done it a little bit higher so that the bottom wasn't as thin because I feel like this could tear at any moment, but it's, it's done me two molds, so it's not done bad. Once the silicon is set, rip off the cardboard and carefully peel off the bottom bit. The bottom bit is what will be the top part of the silicon mold. You'll notice some leakage as it's covered underneath, but you can easily just clean that up with a blade and that's what I did. I went over it with my scalpel and just carefully cut around the edge so that I had access to the actual mold. Make sure you check the instructions on how long to set the silicon before using it because I'm sure that every brand is different. But once it was set, I think I left it about two or three days just to be sure because I hadn't mixed it well. Then it was time to mix up the resin to fill the mold. You can either do this with the little measuring cups they provide if they have it, or you can do it based on weight. Depending on the resin brand you buy, it will require you to do it differently. For me, I used the little measuring cups and I mixed up two cups, one in red and one in orange. The thought process behind this was I wanted a gradient. Um, it did not necessarily go to plan, but when I look at it in the light, you can definitely see that there is red and orange in there. So I do think it made a really nice little aesthetic design. You can see it more though in the second one I did in which I made the colors paler because I think that I went too dark the first time. I poured it all in very carefully after stirring slowly because you don't want air bubbles. If you, if you whisk it like that, you're gonna put so much air into it that it's not gonna look nice. So stir it slowly, be patient with it, and then pour it in. Once I'd filled the mold, I decided to run a skewer about inside to kind of mix up the color a little bit more. I don't know if it did anything. Again, you can't tell because the color's too dark on that. You can tell where I did that on this one because it almost looks like blood in the water where the ink is and it's so pretty. Now the thing with resin is even once it's hardened, it can still be flexible for a little bit of time. So I do recommend leaving it in the mold much longer than you need to. If it says 24 hours until hardened, please leave it in for like 72 hours because you will thank me. I don't know if you can see in this, but this is the one I took out of the mold after 24 hours. And rather than being perfectly flat, it curves up because um, it was still bendy when I took it out of the mold. Now it's not, it's properly hard now, but then it was. You will notice when you take out the resin that it will have the same texture as the foam. So if you want it much smoother, then either do a better job sanding your original mold or just sand the version you've got. I honestly really liked the texture that this one had. It made it feel more raw, like a crystal that had just been ripped out of the wall or something, as opposed to looking like a perfectly polished gemstone. While I do like both of them, and this one is much cleaner and much nicer to the touch, and it looks so much better, 
this one to me feels more realistic to the show and the story itself and I love that it's got some mixing textures in there because it makes it feel more real to me. Anyway, now you have your resin base, you have a foam base, should we talk about the cardboard base? So since cardboard is a lot more flimsy, I did decide to do it all in one piece. I drew around the foam dagger to get my pattern as opposed to printing out and wasting paper to get another one. But if you are doing cardboard from scratch, then just use the paper pattern. We're also not going to talk about how I drew this bit on the wrong way around, where this is meant to be facing the other way. We just, we don't talk about that, okay? Pretend it's fine. I wasn't going to remake it, especially since I didn't notice until I was finished painting it. So since I'm a cosplayer, I order a lot of stuff, so I use the packaging boxes from that. I made up a load of layers and then stacked them all together like I did with the foam, just by hot gluing them. Funnily enough, I actually had the most fun making the cardboard one because I've not made cardboard props in like 14 years. And every time I encountered a problem, like, oh, how can I fix the seams? I was like, oh, I can just use foam clay. And then I was like, no, you can't because this needs to be for baby cosplayers, this needs to be accessible without myriads of expensive materials. So after thinking on it a little while, I was like, what if I just filled them all with hot glue? So I gave that a shot and I filled it all with hot glue. And it was really, really bumpy and messy. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I don't like that finish. Maybe I can sand it. And I was like, there's got to be a way I can do this without making baby cosplayers buy sandpaper and put them off crafting forever, which they realize how tedious sanding is. And then I was like, well, it's hot glue, right? It, it'll melt and smooth. A lighter was an option, but it was also cardboard, so I didn't want to risk setting anything on fire. It's also dangerous for baby cosplayers. The heat gun was out of the question because that's another tool that they'd have to buy. So in the end, I just used the hot glue gun that I already had used for this. Using the tip of the hot glue gun, I held it to the edge and very slowly moved it along, letting the heat from the gun melt the glue as it went and smooth it out. I did this a few times and it probably took me about two hours to go around the entire gun, but it was so therapeutic. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I would rather do that than sanding any day. <laughs> was the result perfect? No, but it definitely hid all of the little lines of cardboard, which I was so excited about. I was so proud of myself. <laughs> so cardboard tends to have this kind of bobbly texture if you're using things like packaging boxes, and I wanted it to have a much smoother surface. So I used Easter egg and cereal boxes. <laughs> because this has a much smoother coating, I could just cut out the same pattern and glue that over the top to create a nicer base. I think I skipped that bit earlier, but that's what I did. Of any extra patterns, I use cardboard as well. However, I do wish I'd made these black bits bigger because these were originally designed to fit the foam size, not this size. But if you're doing it the way that I've told you to do it instead of the way I did it, then it will still be fine. Now, for the foam dagger, I wanted a decent handle that would be comfortable to hold and lightweight and super easy and not have to worry about it. So I went to B&Q and picked up a PVC pipe and then I just used like this head on my Dremel to cut through it. It's again, the same Dremel tool, but it's like a little head you can get that's like a disc and it just cuts right through it. So I measured out what I wanted and cut that out. I used the heat gun on the PVC in order to have it fit better to the base. However, if you are doing this, please, please, please make sure that you are wearing a mask and a decent mask at that because you do not want those fumes getting into your lungs. It is toxic. If you are sanding anything, use a mask. If you are heating something, especially things that are plastic, use a mask. Toxic fumes will catch up to you eventually and it's not worth the health risk. Make sure you're also doing things like that in a well-ventilated area, or in my case, I had a fan on and the window open. My reference pictures for Night Slayer showed the handle being wider at the top and thinner at the bottom, so in order to accomplish that, I realized I couldn't do that with PVC pipe. I had some white warbler laying around. It doesn't matter which color warbler you use, the white tends to be the stickiest and the easiest to mold that I've found, but um, I just used the white because I had it. So I heated up strips and built up the base that I wanted between these two. Warbler is a material that goes soft when heated and then once it cools, it is solid. 
So I knew it would be a good stable base to support the weight of the top half and the bottom half considering they are two separate pieces. In order to smooth it out, I heated it up and used a spoon as well to press and smooth out any edges. It didn't matter too much because it's going to be wrapped in fabric, but you will definitely notice if you don't do that. But yeah, there's our three separate handles. Another reason I didn't sand this dagger was because I didn't want it to be too sharp. I wanted it to be con safe and not sharp like, say, a shark tooth. Speaking of shark teeth, have you ever wanted to be bitten by a shark? No? What about by this guy or this guy? Well, this guy right here or this guy that leads us into today's sponsor shark bait the dating sim game about shark boys written directed and produced by me <laughs> shark bait is a free-to-play dating sim written by yours truly it is spicy and you can romance and seduce any shark that there is art of even this guy the god unrelated fun fact did you know that sharks have two yeah, Sharkbait is within the app Dorian, which allows people to create their own visual novels using their own art without the need for coding. I have earned no money from this sponsorship. <laughs> There's not even a real sponsorship, really. I just, I just want people to play my game. <laughs> like I said, it's free to play. I will put a link in the description. So please go check it out if you've got some time. After that very subtle and smooth segue, I believe we get back to the tutorial now. For making the tips on the ends of the blade, I just cut it out of foam, same way I did with the main dagger. For this one and for the resin one i used this material called sintra which is broken there because i was spinning this around and i dropped it let me find my super glue don't talk about this i dropped it and i was like wow it didn't break expecting the resin to have broken instead this very very fragile tip broke instead which no, yeah, it's fine, I suppose. But yes, I use this strong material. It doesn't seem strong now, but it's just because the tip of this is very small. But I use this material called Sintra. It's like this kind of Foamex plastic. Very, very toxic when heated. So definitely use a mask and well ventilate the room before you take the mask off again. Because if those fumes go in your lungs, it like creates acid in there. It's not nice at all. I've actually made an entire sword out of Sintra before, and that was the sword I used for Bennett from Genshin Impact. Except this one actually lights up. I was considering doing a light up Night Slayer, but honestly, I just did not have the time or energy to do that. Your boy's disabled, all right? Like I only have so much energy to give throughout the day. And the Bennett sword took me like two to three straight weeks of 10 to 12 hour days. I'm not doing that again. It's bad for my health. So I made this one up out of Sintra along with the handle bit of that. In order to make it easier on myself for painting, I painted black on the resin part first because I wasn't adding an extra sheet over there. Because this one is all foam. I carved it out with the dagger to save me on sanding and then just hand sanded it. Starting from a high grit, which is usually a smaller number, down into a higher number, which is a finer grit, so smoother sandpaper to create it a nice smooth surface. And then I made sure that it fit in the pipe and shoved it in there with a load of glue. I then cut out all of the parts needed for the handle. I wanted there to be some high and low risers between it, so I'd prepared this already in my head when I was making the pattern. And I just proceeded to cut those bits out. However, when I did that, there was inevitably a gap at the edge here and where these pieces met. So I worked out where the handle would be and then created more of this piece here. I then laid up three pieces of foam between this to create some kind of depth to it. I'm using thinner foam so that when I add layers, it doesn't build up too high. I'm using thin layer of contact adhesive on each bit before layering them on top of each other and then cutting around the edge to make sure that they are all the same size. A fun hack I use while trying to line up foam so I know where to put the glue is I will hold down the piece on top and then run my nail lightly along it and it will leave a small indent in the foam so that I know exactly where I need to put the glue so I don't waste any foam and it's much less cleanup. The third bit along the edge of the blade here, I'm just going to cut that off with my scalpel so that I don't have as much sanding work to do and sand it down till it's nice and smooth. As for this bit, I measured out the width it would be and then cut off a strip and then just glued it on and then cut off a bit at the top. <laughs> I don't know, I think it did the job. For this part here that goes over and across, I don't know the names of any of these things, by the way, so please feel free to correct me in the comments if you know the names for it. But for this bit here going all the way across and around, I just made a paper version and then tested it out to see if it would match up with size. Keep in mind that when using paper templates, foam thickness does come into play when you are bending around corners. 
When it's one millimeter thick like this, it doesn't matter too much, but the thicker foam you go, the more length you'd have to apply. The best way to work this out is to get strips of foam in your desired thickness and measure out on it, like one inch, two inch, three inch or centimeters, whatever you're doing, and then you can fold it around and see just how much changes with the thickness of it. And I did the same for the resin blade out of Sintra. Sintra is much harder to cut. It is a nightmare and my arms hurt for a couple of days afterwards because I'm weak. But with a sharp enough blade, applying pressure over and over and over again on the same parts, you eventually cut your way through it. You can use a Dremel to sort of cut through things. And I tried, I really did, but it ended up coming out a lot worse and I had to redo it anyway. So I'd rather just do it by hand and have more control. For the wrist guardy part of the resin blade, I had to heat up the Sintra in order to bend it. Again, please use a mask when heating up Sintra as it is PVC. Since Sintra is not squishy like foam, this was a little bit too big, but there was no way based on the size of sheets of Sintra that I had that I could make it smaller. So what I did do was get the heat gun on it and push it into shape so that it flexed and bent around the blade as needed. There was still gaps, but these were manageable. Then for hiding any gaps and edges, I just pushed in scraps of warbler and then sanded them down so that they were the same smooth texture as everything else. As always, I did the same for the cardboard one as well, except the difference here is the middle bit here in the hilt, I wanna say hilt, um, I used thicker cardboard to pad that up. And to save me using the hot glue technique again, I just use a strip of cardboard the same width around it like I did with the foam for each edge that was showing. I didn't want these bits sticking up too thick because I didn't want to have to deal with the texture of the other cardboard, so I just used the cereal boxes for those. Before we can do any painting, we need to prime this. The cheapest prime I could think of that's also kind of self-leveling and works in the same kind of way as things like Hexflex is PVA glue. I picked up this tub of PVA glue for I think a pound at the works about three years ago and I still have it. But I just covered the entire thing in multiple layers of PVA glue. I let one side dry. I would do it in the morning when I woke up and then by the time I went to bed it was dry enough for me to do another layer and then I flipped it over and did the same the next day. Um, until I had like two or three layers on each side and edge. Actually just smooth it on with your finger. <laughs> I've primed both of these bits in flexi paint. And for these little stud bits, welcome to a cosplayer's worst kept secret, googly eyes. The only reason I didn't also use them for this is because even the smallest ones I had were too big for the look that I wanted. So instead I pulled out the trusty hot glue gun and spent ages making little blobs and trying to get the perfect blob that I could squish slightly down to look like a rivet without it being too big or too small and have them all look even. I only needed four, but I managed to do it. It did take me about 15 minutes though. One thing I do want to know is it's fine for this, but if I was to enter this in a competition, I would want to sand off and smooth the edges a lot better because you can still see each individual foam strip in the edge, which is not something that you want if you're doing a competition. But if you're doing it just for funsies, it doesn't matter. <laughs> And when it comes to wrapping the handle in fabric, I had two fabrics available to me in my fabric closet. One I used for the cardboard one was a foam suede and it's really, really nice, but it does fray quite easily. I do, however, love the texture and I'm a sucker for foam suede. For the resin and the foam blade, I used this cotton that kind of looks like bandages. You can, if you want to, go in with like eyeshadow and dust up the edges and make it look even more weathered if that's something that you want to do. Any paint that got on it, it's just, it's battle damage. It's weathering. We don't worry about it. We don't talk about it. Now we get to move on to the painting. Now I am cheap, so I do not want to go out and buy more paint specifically for this. So I wanted to use what I already had in. Originally, I was going to airbrush the resin dagger so that it had three different types of painting. However, I couldn't find my airbrush. <laughs> the ADHD really got me there. So instead, I decided to just use the airbrush paints. So I shook them up and used them with a brush instead. Don't be afraid to mix colors, play about with it. You can do lots of layers to see what it is that you want as the final product. Because I wanted them to be metallic and shiny, I put a coat of silver down first. I have this tub of flexi paint that I can't get the lid open on, so I turned it upside down and used it as a paint pot. And I tested the colors out first on just the black and the silver to see what kind of outcome that I liked best before doing on the actual daggers. And as long as you're not doing this on the actual project, you can speed up the drying process with a heat gun, but you don't want to do it on your actual project because it will bubble up and it will ruin the texture and the surface and you might have to scrap it and redo the whole thing. So I used a burnt iron and a coppery color mixed together to get the kind of color I want for the resin one. I wanted it to be darker and come up with this kind of rich, irony color, but I didn't want to go too dark because I still wanted to be able to create shadows and highlights. 
I did shadows in all the parts where the shadows will fall and I did highlights where light would probably catch. Another fun little tip when painting is to add in weathering. In this case, since it's metal, when it scratches and things like that, it would probably be silver underneath, right? So I used silver and just dry brushed some parts on where it would have been like scuffed or knocked and the paint would have like chipped away. For my cardboard dagger, I could not find any cheap black acrylics in my house. So I did use Hexflex acrylic paint just for the black bits. The only difference is it's really highly pigmented, so you don't need as many coats. However, I did find painting the cardboard version that one or two coats was not enough PVA glue um, because there would still be patches that the paint just wouldn't take. So it did take a few coats because it would just wrinkle and crease in certain areas that I just didn't want it to. For painting the cardboard dagger, I actually bought a bulk of um, acrylic tube paints from Amazon a while back. They're really old now, they're probably like five years old. I don't even know if you can still use them, but they work and I'm not gonna throw them out if they work. And because I wanted more cool tones than warm tones, I mixed it with a silver instead of a gold metallic. And that way you metallicify the acrylic paint. It will, however, water the color down. So you'll have to go a little bit darker than you expect if you want it to be a darker color. Then I just did a few coats of that and did the exact same thing that I did on the resin dagger for weathering. You'll see that all three daggers have slightly different colored hilts as well. And that's just because I wanted to play around with color and see what I liked the best. And I actually, I don't know what I like the best, to be honest with you. <laughs> don't forget to do the little crescent moon at the bottom. For the red on the foam, I used metallic red hex flex from Polyprops and I decided to paint the entire dagger red because I felt it was just like, to be honest, I just like the color, okay? I So sue me. <laughs> And for the cardboard one, I wanted to try out a gradient like the reference image to see if it looked nice or it made any difference. Because like I said, there's no one right way to do things. You can do things multiple ways. You can change it up and do whatever makes you happiest when doing it. The only times you have to worry about accuracy is when you're entering a cosplay competition. And even then it depends on the cosplay competition. When doing the cardboard one though, I made sure that the red was darker at the tip going out because I liked the gradient effect. And when doing the foam one, I took a darker red, which the only dark for red metallic I had was a uh, brush red, but you could also just mix a little bit of black in with the hex flex. And I just shaded in certain areas just behind dips. It isn't very noticeable on camera, but it does show up in person just to give it a little bit of depth. And once you've painted the blade, don't forget to very carefully go over the black edges and make it all nice and neat. Another technique I have seen people do when doing that is to tape off the area so that they can get a nice clean line. I do not have tape or the willpower and time and effort and energy it takes to do that. So I'd rather just risk it with my unsteady hand and go, it's good enough. Cause isn't that what it's all about? Being good enough. <laughs> a top coat is something clear that you will put over the top of your paint job to make sure that it doesn't chip. Think of it like a protective layer or shield just to go over the top to make sure that you can't scratch away at the paint. For the cardboard one, we just use PVA glue again. Except this time I only really did one thick coat on either side. Just like Hexflex and Flexi Paint, you can just wet your finger and smooth out PVA glue as well, which is really great. Honestly, PVA glue and hot glue, super underrated in the cosplay community, I swear. For the foam clay, usually I would use Hexflex Clear to show you a difference. However, um, like I've said three times, I think already, I don't have any Hexflex Clear on me. So I also used PVA glue. Uh, the goal of this is to see if it does any different for me than Hexflex, because I'm used to working with Hexflex and not PVA glue. And honestly, the only comment I have to make on it in comparison is that PVA glue is a lot shinier. It's more of a gloss, whereas Hexflex is more of a satiny shine. Both shiny, just one shinier than the other. And for our beautiful resin dagger, I used a clear coat spray. However, the one I used was really old and didn't have much left, so it didn't leave a very nice finish on it. And if you want to hear about how I did this one to this standard, I did all the previous steps for the resin dagger. And then I actually just sanded it. I used a mouse sander on the top, which is like the ones that are a bit larger and they just kind of vibrate. So I did that over the top to try and get both sides even because one side was wider than the other. And it also dipped in slightly because of where the resin mold was. I then took my Dremel and I sanded into each crevice to get it all nice and smooth as I could. I then painfully took it to my kitchen sink and wet sanded it by hand. Wet sanding is where you just take sandpaper and the water and you just shh with the water. I just find it much easier to deal with resin for stuff like that. It also means you don't get loads of particles in the air. 
I kept going until I reached the finest grit that I had and then it kind of frosted over the resin. But obviously that means we've lost all that pretty detail inside. So with my brand new clear coat that I bought and have not yet used on this, I sprayed it all over and waited for it to dry. And then it's all of a sudden made it clear again. And you can see the difference between where it has been sprayed and where it hasn't. I don't know if you can in this camera at all, but this bit has not been sprayed, it has only been sanded and this bit has been sprayed. It's so shiny and I think this one's gonna turn out the best. But yes, that is how I made three versions of the Night Slayer dagger from Solo Leveling. I honestly had no idea what Solo Leveling was going into the premiere that I was invited to and I went in completely blind. And then when I came out, the first thing I did was load up the webtoon on Tappy Toon. I then bought all the episodes and spent the next three days binging the entire thing. <laughs> It's such a good webcomic. So thank you very, very much for watching. If you want me to do more tutorials like this, or I do things out of cardboard, foam, resin, other materials, then please let me know and I will consider doing more so in the future. I'm also mentally planning on doing a beginner cosplay series where you basically learn basic wig styling, basic craftsmanship, things like that at super basic levels like the cardboard foam and those super cheap wigs that you can get and how to style them to make them look decent. I do a range of things on this channel from cosplay music videos to tutorials to explaining what Omegaverse is to my mum. taught me to walk, I taught you about knotting. <laughs> Equivalent exchange. So yeah, stay if you've got the time and I will see you in the next video. Bye guys.